What's up guys, it's Kayla and Jim. Welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. The allergies are still in full swing, so again, <laughs> forgive me, but what are we talking about today? Today, we are going to talk about the long-anticipated case study on the Superstorm of 1993, the Storm of the Century. So this is going to be very interesting. There are a lot of things with this storm. Oh, if you don't yes. know about this storm, it occurred, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary of this storm, March 1993. This storm affected basically the area from Central America all the way northward into Canada. Yeah. So this was a very big storm. We had a number of components come together at the right time in the right place to produce such a massive storm. It brought conditions like tornadoes, blizzards, wind chill values to the southern U.S. that aren't normally experiencing those even in January, let alone mid-March. Right. Uh, we had storm surge. There was yep. a lot of things going on. Uh, I believe there was record wind gusts. All occurring in mid-March when a lot of people are thinking spring break. True. Especially yes. along the southern U.S. So for this storm to crank up at this point and to produce all this extreme weather, it's incredible. Yeah. But before before we get started. <laughs> Give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it along the way. Make sure that you are subscribed down below. Down there you will find the links to everything that we are going to talk about today. So all of the links that we used to put together this case study, as well as our school of weather. If you are an aspiring meteorologist or just somebody who loves weather and you want to learn the basics of meteorology, but you're not sure if you want to go to school for it, or you're definitely not about the math for school, so you want a non-math approach to learning about the topics that you would hear about in a college level intro class, check out our School of Weather linked below. Now let's get into the synoptic setup for the storm of the century. About five days before the storm developed, computer models were forecasting a rapid development of an intense low pressure system over the Gulf of Mexico. Computer models were not as advanced as they are today, so for computer models to predict such a strong storm five days in advance was incredible, almost unbelievable. How could a weak low pressure system deepen so fast over a relatively short amount of time? As the days wore on, the computer models kept predicting the same incredible development of a strong to intense storm system. Not only were the models predicting this many days in advance, but their solutions were all painting the same picture. With each passing model run, they became more and more consistent, predicting what meteorologists call a bomb cyclone. A bomb cyclone is a low pressure system that rapidly deepens at least 24 millibars in a 24 hour period. Around 12 UTC on March 11th, a surface low pressure area had formed over northern Mexico. At the 500 millibar level, or roughly 18,000 feet, a trough was approaching from the west and an even stronger mid-level trough was gaining strength further upstream over the Rockies of the U.S. Over the next 24 hours, the surface low would move offshore over the warm waters of the northwestern Gulf of Mexico near Brownsville, Texas, and would have a central pressure of 1,002 millibars at 12 UTC on March 12th. Something interesting was that the surface temperatures of the waters were about 3 degrees Celsius above normal for March the polar and subtropical jet streams began to phase together and deepen. Arctic air pushed southward from Canada down through the Great Plains. Deep, moist tropical air began flowing northward from the Caribbean. A strong temperature contrast zone called a baroclinic zone developed over the northwestern Gulf of Mexico between the Arctic air mass and a warm, humid air mass that was surging northward. The combination of the Arctic air moving south, tropical air moving north, a strong mid-level trough, and the phasing of the polar and subtropical jet streams would set the stage for what would become the storm of the century. As the low moved northeastward along the Bear Clinic zone, 
The warm, moist air mass made its way into the lower Mississippi Valley, Deep South, and Florida. The contrast between the two air masses only strengthened the baroclinic zone further, which now extended across the entire northern Gulf of Mexico. An area of mid-level cyclonic circulation, associated with the first upper-level trough, continued to strengthen the low-pressure system. However, it was the second upper-level trough that would cause the explosive development of the low later on. Due to the expanding and increasing temperature gradient across the southern U.S. seaboard and adjacent Gulf waters, the westerly jet rapidly increased in speed. Research has shown that the presence of such strong jet streaks is an indication of strong baroclinicity, which would determine the subsequent explosive deepening of the storm. At zero UTC on March 13th, the low was located over the warm Gulf waters, about 150 kilometers south of New Orleans. Due to missing observations in the regional data assimilation system, the central pressure was analyzed to be 992 millibars at this time. However, reanalysis of this system the following year found that the central pressure could have been as low as 984 millibars. A surface cold front intensified rapidly and began moving into the central Gulf of Mexico. As the cold front pushed eastward, it developed a strong squall line. A southerly low-level jet developed out ahead of the squall line, which provided a warm conveyor belt that transported warm, moist air northward from the Gulf into the deep south, Florida, and southeast U.S. Meanwhile, the baroclinic zone began moving northward as a warm front due to the influence of the southerly jet. Precipitation began to fall over the southeast U.S. in response to warm, moist air advecting over the warm front. South of the warm front, conditions were destabilizing rapidly, which would allow the squall line to intensify even more. In addition, the contrast between the warm advection ahead of the squall line and the strong cold advection behind the cold front continued to increase. The low continued eastward and made landfall along the Florida Panhandle just after midnight on March 13th. As the night progressed, snow began to spread over the eastern U.S. Storm surge as high as 12 feet impacted the west coast of Florida. The squall line swept across Florida producing about 25 tornadoes and damaging wind gusts to 110 miles per hour, as well as impacting Cuba with the Cuban Weather Service reporting 120 mile per hour wind gusts from severe thunderstorms. By 12 UTC on the morning of March 13th, the warm front had moved northward and was now parallel to the U.S. East Coast. The low had deepened to 973 millibars as the mid-level rotations, upper-level troughs, and a screaming 200 mile per hour jet positioned themselves very close to the low. In fact, a unique situation was happening where the low pressure system was located beneath the right entrance region of the northern jet and the left exit region of the southern jet. Both positions are known for causing low pressure systems to develop rapidly. These conditions allowed the low to quote unquote bomb, deepening 30 millibars in 24 hours as it moved up the eastern seaboard of the U.S. The U.S. Coast Guard reported sea conditions in the Gulf as being like a big washing machine. Huge waves, enormous spray, and hail were experienced out in the Gulf. Many buoys reported sustained hurricane force wind speeds. The seas were so rough that a 200-foot freighter sank about 70 miles offshore of Fort Myers, Florida. The low would track up the eastern seaboard of the U.S. during the day, Saturday the 13th. Blizzard to whiteout conditions were felt over much of the eastern seaboard, with thunder snow experienced from Texas to Pennsylvania. Cities across the deep south and southeastern U.S. that typically receive little to no snow were experiencing unheard of snowfall amounts as well as record low temperatures. Birmingham, Alabama recorded a record low of 2 degrees Fahrenheit and snowfall between 12 and 16 inches in the metro area. Other areas as far south as central Georgia and Alabama received 4 to 6 inches of snow. Even parts of the Florida Panhandle got in the act with 2 inches of snow and hurricane force winds. As the snow continued to pile up across the south, it would cause many factory roofs to collapse under all that weight. The heaviest snowfall was at Newfound Gap, where U.S. Highway 441 crosses the Tennessee and North Carolina border, where 5 feet of snow and drifts up to 14 feet were observed at Mount Mitchell. Flattop Mountain, North Carolina, recorded a wind gust of 101 miles per hour, 
with wind gusts as high as 110 miles per hour at adjacent locations. The record snowfall trapped many people in the Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia mountains. Over 200 hikers were rescued from the North Carolina and Tennessee mountains alone. Residents were being notified of enforced curfews in many counties and cities, where states of emergency were declared. Basically, all interstate highways from Atlanta northward had been shut down. By Saturday night, 0 UTC on March 14th, the low entered its occlusion stage and had a central pressure of 966 millibars. Wind gusts at Mount Washington, New Hampshire were recorded at 144 miles per hour. The low would continue to move northward over the next 24 hours into Canada with one last gasp of strength as it moved across the coastal region of the Labrador Sea. By Sunday night, 0 UTC on March 15th, the squall line to the south started to dissipate. As the hours passed, the low exit in Canada would continue to move out to sea, pushing further into the North Atlantic, lessening its grip on the eastern seaboard and allowing weather conditions to improve. In summary, the amount of precipitation that fell from the storm totaled around 44 million acre-feet. That's enough water to flood 44 million acres of land one foot deep. The amount of snowfall that fell from this storm totaled just under 13 cubic miles. The storm system directly affected over 130 million people. 40% of the U.S. population were directly affected by the storm. Damaging straight line winds and at least 15 confirmed tornadoes were reported across Florida. Some reports were as high as 25 tornadoes. Nearly 60,000 lightning strikes were recorded in a 72 hour period. Strong onshore winds along Florida's west coast created a storm surge up to 12 feet high in Taylor County, with significant damage to property. 13 people drowned in the storm surge. Seas were estimated as high as 65 feet. Up to 10 million customers lost electricity due to the storm. Power outages on the average lasted for one to two weeks over many areas in the east. The storm system was responsible for 300 deaths, many caused by heart attacks as they were shoveling snow. Every major airport from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Atlanta, Georgia was closed at one point by the storm. The Coast Guard deployed more than 100 planes, helicopters, and boats during the storm. They rescued 235 people as well as more than 100 boats in the Gulf of Mexico. A record low pressure of 960 millibars was recorded in New England. Record low temperatures were recorded across much of the south. This storm system caused some cities to adopt an emergency winter weather plan for the future. In all, the superstorm of 1993 produced over $6.6 .6 billion in damage, according to 1993 U.S. dollars. Today, in 2023, that would be equivalent to 13.7 billion U.S. dollars. Now that was a, a lot <laughs> going on. There's a lot of synoptic stuff. There, there was a lot of, you know, jets and barrel clinic zones and stuff. And hopefully the images that went along with that kind of explained what everything was. So in order to keep this video under, you know, an hour and a half <laughs> long, let's talk about some of those uh, crazy facts that we just saw in the summary, starting with those lightning strikes. Yes, around 60,000 lightning strikes in a 72 hour period. So that just goes to show how much instability, how strong the dynamics were, just the prolonged duration of this event right. to cause that many lightning strikes is just absolutely incredible. I know with other strong cold fronts that have gone through in the past, you know, you may have seen up to 10,000, 12,000 lightning strikes right. in, in a night, and that would be a very active cold front. And yeah. this one had 60,000, so that was just incredible to me when I saw that stat. Yeah, and going from supercells and tornadoes to like hurricanes and storm surge to snowstorms and everything, one of the facts was that this low ended up in the right entrance area of one jet and the left exit area of another jet, which if you are familiar with severe weather at all, to have a storm that sets up in one of those areas is like, whoa, and there's this huge like deepening of the low pressure there, but for one single storm to be, or one single low pressure system to be in both of those areas at the same time for everything to have come together, that is just insane that the atmosphere even did that. Like, 
uh, it's, it's unheard of. Like like we were talking about the the models predicting stuff almost unbelievable. Yeah, and I was working for the Weather Service back at that time, and you know the models back then were. <laughs> they were nothing like they are now. You used a stone tablet and a chisel, right? That's and kind right. Of chiseled out the cold fronts. That's right. So, um, you know, working in weather and dealing with the models that you had back then, the layers and and the granularity that we have now, it, it wasn't like that. It was so coarse for the models to be consistent because back then the modeling physics was a lot different and for each model it was different, I mean significant, to the point <laughs> we'd be forecasting going, okay this model says there's going to be a low, this model says it's going to be a sunny day, you know it's going to be <laughs> rain here, sunny here. So we would get a lot of that conflict 48 hours out, let alone you know 120 hours out predicting a storm. And so for these models to actually start predicting this five days in advance, it was almost a slam dunk you know, shoe in that this thing is going to happen. I was living in the Northeast at the time when this storm happened, and I remember hearing on the radio that the snow that was falling in the Northeast was because of the low pressure system that was down, still down, in the Gulf. And that was Friday night, and I had gotten off of work, and I'm going, you know, it's snow, it's incredible. The stream of that, you know, rising air and the snow starting to fall, and you go, we're going to get snowed in this, this weekend. There's just no way we're going anywhere. And as the day progressed on Saturday, just watching the snowfall, and, and Albany had, uh, I think they reported 27 inches as official, maybe at the airport. Wow. But where, where we were, we were up to 30 to 35 inches where we were on the front lawn. So incredible weekend. It was one of those things where it's Friday night. You know, we're shutting ourselves in, just let it <laughs> snow and don't go back out, you know, until Monday, so. Okay. I mean, the snow, you're talking about Albany, New York, but going all the way down to Georgia and the Florida Panhandle and all these places that don't normally see snow having, you know, half a foot to feet of snow and closing down all of the interstates and all of the airports, it's... Yes a storm that it, it's one of those storms it's not going to happen again most likely and it was incredible that it happened the first time yeah that's why it's a storm of a century right storm it's of century. one of those storms that happens once in a <laughs> hundred yeah. years so yeah. this storm had so many different things associated with it it's yeah. Trying, trying to make a video for this and try to keep it <laughs> right. in a relatively, you know, short time span, you know, so that it keeps everyone's attention. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's incredible. You know, just trying to touch on all the things because right. this has so many things associated with it. Yeah, let's touch on one other thing. Um, 960 millibars. There are hurricanes that don't get that low. And we're talking about just a low pressure system that was lower than a ton of hurricanes, uh, another, I keep using this word, word, but an incredible, incredible fact. So there you have it, the March 12th through 15th, 1993 storm of the century. If you guys were affected by this event, we would love to hear your experience down in the comments below. It affected pretty much, what, 40% of the entire United States, so I'm sure some of you have experience with this storm, as well as our friends in Canada, in Mexico, in Cuba, and everybody down in that Gulf of Mexico area where the storm first started. We always love to hear from personal experience down in the comments. We'll be hanging out down there after the video is posted. Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below. It really helps us out a lot and it helps boost this video to get it to more people who have similar experiences to you or love weather as much as you do. Don't forget to check out all the links that we talked about in the beginning of the video, still linked down below. And follow us over on our weather adventures, Facebook and Instagram popping up here. And until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. would set the stage for what would become the storm of the century. Oh, he's good! Nailed it! Boom! <laughs>